Chairperson, and, uh, thank you, Minister. The, the, the piece of business that you had to do in front of us was very short. Yes. And uh, maybe there might be other ministers who might have used the opportunity to escape thereafter, but uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you've taken the time to uh, do an Ask Me Anything session with uh, the <laughs> committee members. So I very much appreciate it. I have a list of reasons. As long as my arm, and I, I don't think I'll get through all of them. But I, I am going to start with the news of the day, as, uh, as you described it around those um, HEA expression of interest process and um, I suppose like others in the committee of course I, I turned to my own region and I was very I was delighted to see that the three bids from SETU had been judged to be viable to go on to the next stage of the process that's in the veterinary places the pharmacy and, and the expansion of the, the nursing places um, but it's a question I put to the Taoiseach earlier today on the floor of the door he, he expressed the opinion that in the fullness of time we might need all of these places um, but I do know there's a process now whereby these go to uh, deeper. It has to be a full business case developed. And I suppose it's from there that the rubber really meets the road. So I, I would just like an insight from you, Minister, how long you think that process will make and whether you have an opinion or an insight as to how many of those places which have come through that first hurdle, uh, how many of them we expect to be rolled out and, and the timeline for that. Yeah, look, thanks very much. Firstly, I want to join with you in acknowledging the success of the South East Technological University, and you've been a huge supporter of that, and I acknowledge that in, in bringing it about. But if you think about it, we've gone from no university to, to one in the South East. We've gone from a Waterford Crystal site that was an aspiration to secure it, plans coming on for student accommodation, and now today, whatever else happens beyond this point, you know, really high quality applications that are being seen as such, not just by me or you, but by independent panels looking at it and assessing it. Uh, and that speaks, I think, a credit to the leadership of SET, and I want to acknowledge uh, that publicly here today. So, 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 so there's the, the answer to your question is this. The Department of Health is of the view that all of the, all of the places that have been identified are required by them in the coming years. So it will be a matter for myself and Minister Donnelly through the estimates process, but even more particularly through the National Development Plan review process now to secure the funding and try and programmatically uh, roll, roll that out. Um, the Department of Agriculture, my colleague, the Minister for Agriculture, and I have a piece of work to do around identifying how many of the veterinary places that the system says could be provided are viewed needed by the Department of Agriculture, and then we do that piece in terms of engaging uh, with the Minister for PER. Uh, I, I certainly think, I certainly want to be in a position uh, to be moving this forward in the autumn. Uh, I want to be in a position to see additional capacity coming on stream in 2024 across the disciplines. I think in some areas where you're looking at establishing new schools and the likes, to be honest, it's more likely a 2025 reality, but there's definitely room to be seeing growth in courses in 2024 and expansion of courses. The, what I will just say on veterinary medicine is this, the, the HEA report itself does refer to the importance of regional balance. Uh, and regional development, uh, and that will have to be a factor. Um, both myself and Minister McConnell Oak have said today that we're not, we're not ruling in or out any project in the sense that we're not saying it'll definitely just be one project, it could be more than one. Um, so what we do now is work with the institutions in terms of preparing their business cases, um, and then from the point of view of the Department of Agriculture, just identifying how many of the additional places, 230 that have been identified by the system, do they believe they need in the coming years. Okay, that's very useful. So there's a, there's a way to run yet. Just on, um, on the technological universities, and I do think they have been a huge driver in moving towards that balanced regional development that Senator Dolan was referring to and, and that we're all um, driving towards. I've had an issue raised with me consistently around the transformational funding. And so the transformational funding was uh, extremely important in terms of bringing multi-campus universities, trying to integrate systems, make sure that the staffing worked out correctly, all of those things that were so important. Now, I understand that that transformational funding is coming to an end. Um, I've had several of the universities express to me that there's still a need that while they've traveled very far down the road of becoming one single combined institution, that they're not fully there and that the role of the transformational funding is still important going forward. So I, I just wonder about your own thoughts on that matter. Yeah, look, I'm very conscious that job one was to establish the technological universities and a great amount of work has been done by an incredible amount of people to get to, get to this point. We're now going through a process of, I suppose, assessing projects that are underway that may require, for example, an extension. 
and I know that the HEA and my own department are also considering what other uh, funding avenues may be available. Um, I'm thinking particularly of things like the ERDF, where we know there's there's 83 million. Um, I know there's the National Recovery and Resilience uh, Fund as well. I think there's about 40 million allocated there as well. So we're doing this on a kind of project by project basis, assessing projects that are may need and require an extension. I am due to meet the Technological University chairs and presidents on Thursday, uh, and there will be an opportunity to tease this through with them. But I'm trying to avoid a cliff edge here. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is about we want to invest in these new institutions. We've asked them to do things. We've asked them to start projects, and no one, no one intends to leave them hanging. Um, but we just need, we do at the same time need to ultimately move from a transformation fund in, into, into a more kind of regular way of funding going forward. So we'll tease this uh, through with them. But I, I think there's absolutely going to have to be some form of a step-down funding uh, after the transition fund rather than a cliff edge. And we're, and we're working that through now, and I hope that provides some reassurance to them. OK. Uh, again, to stay with the technological universities, um, we do need these to function as research institutions. And you, you won't be blindsided by this question. It's a question I've put to you before. But uh, I feel, and I know the institutions feel, that there's a, a need to develop a, prof a prof professorship model. Yep. Uh, difficult to say, apparently. Um, so that we, we actually really encourage that that research facility that, you know, they can be huge engines for research uh, in each of their regions, and also the review of academic contracts, uh, because we know that um, the bias, bias is the wrong word, but the balance of the, the contracts that were off previously offered in the ITs was towards teaching, and the teaching burden is such that it's difficult to meaningfully integrate research into that role as well. So. Yeah, I wanted to, to kind of take your thoughts as well on where we go in terms of restructuring what the TUs do uh, as based the ITs so that we can encourage that research capacity. Yeah, so look, we, 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 we're in the same place uh, as a department as you are in terms of how you've presented the situation there. We need to see a step change in terms of research capacity in the technological universities if, to, if they're to achieve their full mission. That would 100% require uh, professors. Uh, it would also require an opportunity um, for those contract discussions to take place. You will be aware that I brought the OECD um, report in relation to what contracts might look like. And it was, it was pretty clear and stark, quite frankly, that um, there's a big body of work to do here and that Ireland's current contract structure isn't in a comparable place to other technological universities or their equivalents um, in other OECD countries. Now, I want to be clear to anybody listening in, um, working in a TU, um, any changes will be matters of for negotiation. And I know sometimes people say, oh, you're having all these conversations, you haven't sat down and talked to us. What we're trying to do at the moment is make sure that we're in a position to have a meaningful conversation. So we're working with the technological universities, I suppose, to make the case uh, to Deeper and others in relation to the need uh, for this change. My officials met with the technological universities last week. Uh, I'm meeting with the technological universities again in the morning, um, and we will tease this through. And if we get to a contract place, it'll be an opportunity for people to obviously opt in to new contracts uh, rather than people um, losing their current terms and conditions. So there's a really interesting and important conversation we can have here. Right. But we want to try and make sure we have a we want to be able to have a meaningful conversation. That's why we've been trying to get our own ducks lined up in terms of deeper before we uh, formally enter those conversations. Very good. <clears throat> and the first instance, before I get to my own questions, I do very much want to back up uh, the chairperson's uh, viewpoint in terms of that teacher education piece. Um, and I do think those centres, that centre of excellence, I'm not saying the model is outdated, but I think the list of centres of excellence that are available uh, within the state I, I, that's quite old, uh, if, if I'm right, it dates back quite a number of years, <clears throat> could be updated and there is certainly a, a history of education, particularly in terms of lifelong education that exists in uh, the Waterford campus of SETU and it's a space that I would like to see SETU get into, quite honestly, because quite a number of the young people who leave the South East region leave it in order to engage in teacher training. And that is a, a flow of our young people that I think everybody across the South East would like to, like to see reversed. Um, Minister, I just wanted to talk to you about a number of questions that um, I have that, that have come from a, an engagement I've had with the Postgraduate Workers' Organisation. And I'm sure that you've had the, the same correspondence and have seen the questions already. And it's, it relates to a review 
that you've been doing in terms of PhDs in Ireland and a couple of issues. I mean, there's a number of is issues that are identified here, um, but something that I think we should very seriously look at if we really are serious about expanding that research capacity, um, as we say that we have, we wish to do. <clears throat> Chief among them for me is that to make a decision around employee status for PhDs. <clears throat> They're in an, an undefined space, and I think we're probably at a step with, with most of our European partners in, in how we define that. Um, similarly, for PhD candidates and students who are from outside of the EU, how we provide the residency visas for those, because I believe they have to update them yearly and that there's a yearly cost involved in that when we know, in fact, they're, they're here hopefully for four years. Uh, and then, obviously, minimum rates of pay and how we, uh, how we make that four-year process of, of becoming, you know, of get, getting your doctorate, how we make that affordable for people and we reward, reward seriously the incredibly valuable research work they do during the process of, of their study. Um, so, as I said, I'm sure this has come across your desk already, Minister, uh, but I did want to put the question, seeing as I had the opportunity. No, look, thanks very much for, for raising it. And I mean, let me just say this at the outset. I mean, this is an area that I'm determined that we make real progress on. Um, we are a country in which our future economic, social well-being um, is dependent on human capital. We spend a lot of time in this place talking about capital, capital spending, capital spending, but we don't talk enough about capital in the context of human capital. Um, and and, and, and a, very, a very real example of that is investing uh, in our people um, in terms of research innovation, the ability for that to then translate into both academia, but crucially into industry and into regions, and the real contribution Ireland Inc. can make um, to challenging some national and, national and global challenges. So let me just say that that is why we decided to commission um, an independent review. I'm very grateful to the co-chairs uh, of that. And I brought the first output of their review to Cabinet uh, yesterday, I think, and uh, it'll be published on Monday. Um, certainly it'll be published early next week, probably Monday. Um, uh, to take each of the issues, we need to make progress on the stipend. I can't get into kind of budget day commitments here and the likes, and we all get the process we have to go through, but the stipend is an issue. It's a real issue, and we need to try and make progress on it. We have made progress, some progress. When I came into this department, we, we moved to equalise the stipend between the IRC and SFI. The IRC one was a lot lower. We have seen some increases in the stipends, but we have more to do. And let's just say we'll all be shocked if the report doesn't indicate that. Um, there is also work that needs to be done, as you quite rightly say, in relation to how we support um, PhD researchers in terms of mitigating the challenges that they uh, experience in relation to the visa system spousal access to the labour market, other issues like this. Um, um, the, the, first out, the first output of this review will, do, will, will address that as well and will come up with recommendations that my department will then need to liaise with the Department of, of Justice on. The third point just around the employee status. And I've, met, I've met researchers and I think it's fair to say people have very strong views on this. Um, what I would just say is this, that I have an open mind in relation to it, but for me, I think fundamentally the most important issue is how we support people, how we address things like access to maternity benefit, uh, paternity benefit, career pathways, healthcare supports, stipend. And when I look, when I look at examples of countries that, that do it well, some of those countries have their PhD researchers classified as employees, and some don't. So for me, I think the most important thing we can do here is make sure that the supports that are in place for PhD researchers are a hell of a lot better than are in place today. And like I say, I know there's strong views on, on both sides of the debate, and they're equally strong, and I've heard them, I've heard them both. Um, but, but the way I'm approaching this, and let's see where, where, where these reviews bring us, but the way I'm approaching this is we have to better support PhD researchers. We have to keep people in Ireland to do research, and we want to, and we need to bring people in. We need the best and, and, the, and the brightest here uh, as well. And we also need to make sure that, and this came out, I think, through some of the stakeholder engagement, that some of the supports that are actually in place to universities are definitely absolutely available to the PhD researchers as well, and that that information is known to them too. So do I believe the stipends need to go up? I do. Do I believe we need to better financially support PhD researchers? I do. Do I believe we need to look at other supports that are 
outside of the stipend and particularly around kind of maternity uh, I do um, and and career pathways yes streamlining and making easier visa processes yes so we've a lot to do here um, and I'm not approaching it kind of with an ideological viewpoint I'm approaching it from the point of view of we've got to make real progress here and what are the practical steps we can take so first step here is the publication uh, next Monday uh, or next week rather and then we go forward to the estimates process thank you that's very helpful minister